this is Alistair McGrath again, speaking to you from my study in Oxford University about the Christian Theology Reader. Now, the ninth chapter of this ten-chapter collection of readings in Christian Theology brings together a group of texts dealing with other religions. And we're going to look at one of these in particular, in which C.S. Lewis reflects on how the Christian faith is able to position other faiths intellectually. In other words, how does Christian theology account for the existence of other faiths, and indeed for no faith at all? It's a question that Christians have talked about for a long time. Christians themselves have always been clear that Christianity is continuous with another religion, namely Judaism. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob is identical with the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Early Christianity emerged within Judaism, and most of the first converts to the movement were themselves Jews. For example, the New Testament frequently mentions Christians preaching in local synagogues, and so similar were the two movements that outside observers, like the Roman authorities, tended to treat Christianity as a kind of Jewish sect, rather than as a new movement with a distinct identity. Now, this emphasis on the continuity between Christianity and Judaism raised a number of difficulties for the early Christians. First of all, there was a question of the role of the Jewish law. How did the law fit into the Christian life? Did the traditional rites and customs of Judaism have any continuing place in the Christian church? And there's evidence that this issue was of particular importance during the 5th and 6th decades of the 1st century, when non-Jewish converts to Christianity came under pressure from Jewish Christians to maintain the traditional rites and customs of Judaism. But as Christianity expanded, the question of its relation with Judaism became less pressing. Christianity went on to encounter other faith systems within the Roman Empire, with which it had no obvious historical or cultural connection. What about its relationship to the mystery religions of the late classical period, and as its expansion continued in later centuries, to Islam, to Hinduism, to the various forms of Buddhism, to African indigenous religions? I have to say, however, that surprisingly little attention was paid to these issues in the theological literature of the Middle Ages and the early modern periods. And in part, this is due to the fact that Western Europe, which was the stronghold for most of the world's Christians from about 1000 to 1800, tended to consist of uniformly Christian societies with little experience of religious diversity. There are exceptions, of course, like medieval Spain, in which Christian, Jewish and Islamic populations coexisted until about 1492. And there are some very interesting examples of Christian theology engaging with Islamic ideas and sources during this period. Yet the overall picture is that Western Christian theology didn't really see the question of other religions as being particularly important up to about 1800. Now, all of that has changed. Two developments brought about this change of perception. First of all, Western colonial expansion led to first-hand encounters between Christianity and other religions, especially in Southeast Asia and Africa. An excellent example is provided by the British occupation of India, which led to the foundation of schools and universities. And British theologians who taught there found themselves having to wrestle with issues arising from the cultural dominance of Hinduism. Now, this had no parallel in any Western society, and it raised the question of how this could be accommodated within a Christian perspective. But there was a second factor, which is that immigration to the West from regions in which Hinduism and Islam were culturally dominant became significant in the period after the Second World War. And the western seaboard of the United States and Canada and many cities in Australia experienced influx of peoples of Eastern faiths, especially those originating from a Chinese context. Immigration from the Indian subcontinent has changed the situation irreversibly within Britain, with Hinduism and Islam becoming the foci of identity for ethnic minorities. 
And the growing presence of non-Christian communities in the West has given a new importance to the intellectual question of how Christianity understands these faith communities. Now, in this presentation, we're going to consider two readings which develop similar approaches, yet in slightly different ways, to the question of Christianity and other belief systems. Our first is reading 1-1, entitled Justin Martyr on Philosophy and Theology, which is actually taken from the first chapter, but sets the scene for C.S. Lewis's important reflections on Christianity and other religions, which is found in the present chapter. And you might like to turn back and find this very first reading in this collection. So who is Justin Martyr? Well, Justin was martyred for his faith at Rome in 165. He set out to show how the gospel links up with secular notions of wisdom. And Justin had a particular concern to relate the Christian faith to the various forms of Platonism, which were influential in the Eastern Mediterranean region at this time. And so he stresses the convergence of Christianity and Platonism at a number of points of importance. And in particular, Justin is drawn to the pivotal idea of the logos. That's a Greek term which means word. And this word logos plays a key role in both Platonic philosophy and Christian theology. You might think, for example, of John chapter 1 verse 14, which affirms that the word, Greek logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. And a central theme in Justin's defence of the Christian faith is the idea that God has scattered the seeds of the Logos throughout the world before the coming of Christ, so that secular wisdom and truth can point, however imperfectly, to Christ. The same is true of traditional pagan religion, which Justin sees as hinting at the Christian faith and which is brought to fulfilment through it. So listen to what Justin says, for all writers who were able to see the truth darkly on account of the implanted seed of the Logos, which was grafted into them. Let me read that again slowly. For all writers were able to see the truth darkly on account of the implanted seed of the Logos, which was grafted into them. And what Justin is saying is that pagan philosophy and religion grasps at a truth it cannot completely grasp, and so ends up with an incoherent and muddled view of reality. For Christians, of course, the Logos has become incarnate in Christ, allowing Christians to see clearly and more fully what is otherwise shrouded in mystery. As Justin puts it, and I quote, since they did not know the Logos, which is Christ, in its entirety, they often contradicted themselves. Now, there are clear echoes of Justin's approach in the writings of the Oxford literary critic and Christian apologist C.S. Lewis. Let me introduce Lewis briefly so we can set his ideas in context. Lewis was a student at Oxford University, and you might like to see this photograph of him here taken in 1917 during his first term at Oxford. And Lewis's first Oxford degree was in classics and his second in English literature. At this stage, Lewis was a rather dogmatic atheist, yet reading classical mythology raised some very difficult questions for him. And in September 1931, Lewis found himself having to confront these questions during a long evening walk with his friend J. R. R. Tolkien in the gardens of Morden College, Oxford. By this time, Lewis had left his atheism behind as inadequate. He now believed in God, but he couldn't quite see why he needed to go beyond a generic view of God and embrace Christianity. Tolkien helped Lewis make that transition. And Tolkien really explained the nature of Christianity to Lewis using the idea of myth. Now, we need to understand here that Tolkien does not use the word myth in the loose sense of a fairy tale or the rather negative sense of a deliberate lie. For Tolkien, a myth is a story 
that conveys fundamental things. In other words, a myth is a story that tries to tell us about the deeper structure of things. And Tolkien argued that the best myths are not deliberately constructed falsehoods, but are rather tales woven by people to capture the echo of deeper truths which are only partly seen. So myths offer us a fragment of the truth, not its totality. They're like splintered fragments of the true light, which for Tolkien, and later Lewis, is Christianity. And Lewis later put it like this. The story of Christ is simply a true myth, a myth working on us in the same way as the others, but with this tremendous difference that it really happened. Lewis now embraced Christianity partly because it created conceptual space for the classic and pagan myths that he loved so much. So let's turn and look at the extract from Lewis's writings, which is taken from a lecture entitled Is Theology Poetry, which Lewis gave at a Socratic club in Oxford in 1945. And Lewis's approach is clearly parallel to that of Justin Martyr, except that well, Justin emphasises the idea of logos, Lewis emphasises the importance of myth. Listen to what Lewis has to say. Theology, while saying that a special illumination has been vouchsafed to Christians and earlier to Jews, also says that there is some divine illumination vouchsafed to all men. And this leads Lewis to make this important statement. We should, therefore, expect to find in the imagination of great pagan teachers and mythmakers some glimpse of that theme which we believe to be the very plot of the whole cosmic story, the theme of incarnation, death and rebirth. Now we know that these ideas were very important in Lewis's own personal development. His realisation that the Christian meta-narrative, that's a good word to use for myth, created space for pagan mythology is one of the things that drew him to faith. He realised he would not have to abandon his love of pagan myth but could see it in a new light. And that realisation led Lewis to argue that the fundamental difference between Christianity and pagan religion is not between falsehood and truth. It's something much more subtle and significant, as this critical sentence makes clear. The difference between a real event on the one hand and dim dreams or premonitions of that same event on the other. This leads Lewis to reflect on how the incarnation fits into the framework he's developed. And for Lewis, the incarnation is all about those dim dreams of humanity becoming solidified and coming into sharper focus in the historical event of Jesus of Nazareth. As Lewis rather nicely puts it, it's like watching something come gradually into focus. First it hangs in the clouds of myth and ritual, vast and vague. Then it condenses, grows hard, and in a sense small, as an historical event in first century Palestine. Now there's much more to say about Lewis, and indeed about the whole theme of Christianity and other faiths. But we need to move on. And so we turn to the final chapter of the Christian Theology Reader, which deals with the theme of the Christian hope. I look forward to joining you again very soon as we look at Cyprian of Carthage reflecting on paradise as the Christian homeland. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll speak to you again very soon. Thank you.